for 20 years, I knew exactly how my legs looked, how they felt, how my prosthetics felt. I had everything dialed in to be able to dance on Dancing with the Stars and snowboard six hours a day. I had spent 20 years of dialing my prosthetics in to be able to do that kind of stuff. Now with a brand new amputation, I was starting over from scratch. Amy Purdy grew up in Las Vegas with a love of nature and a passion for snowboarding. But at 19, she had both her legs amputated below the knee after contracting a life-threatening form of bacterial meningitis that led to septic shock and an induced coma. To say Amy rebounded would be a huge understatement. Over the next 20 years, she led a remarkable life achieving goals most only dream about. Amy became one of the top ranked adaptive snowboarders in the world, winning the bronze medal at the 2014 Paralympics and then the silver in 2018. She also established herself as a successful and extremely powerful inspirational and motivational speaker. And in 2014, she was the runner up in season 18 of Dancing with the Stars. But then in early 2019, Amy suffered a tragic setback that threatened to take away the life she worked so hard to achieve. I spoke with Amy three times over the past three months about this latest challenge, which kicked off an excruciating and emotional two-year journey. This is Amy Purdy's story. If your life were a book and you were the author, how would you want your story to go? That's the question that changed my life forever. When I listened to you or having, you know, just read your story, your memoir, I think most of us can't imagine what you've been through and how you keep going. And what is it like, do you ever think like, what made you strong or what sort of gave you that strength? Yeah, I, I mean, gosh, I, you know, 20 years ago when I went through everything, I was 19. This happened last year when I was turning 40. It's almost, you know, 20 years later. And, and they were different situations. When I was 19, I never cried about losing my legs. I really just kind of picked up the pieces and kept moving forward. I did feel moments of depression. I did over the years, I did feel moments of being down and trying to navigate life with prosthetics or dating with prosthetics or whatever it may be but i never um i never stayed in that space of depression or despair i i would maybe get there and pull myself right out of it and this time was a little bit it was a lot more challenging this time really knocked me down it kind of threw all my beliefs out the window and i had to start over again and so i've really just decided to put my energy into doing everything I can and kind of setting aside the things that I don't have control over. And it's led me to a good spot. I do my best to focus on what I'm grateful for. And there's so much to be grateful for that that's what, that's what gives us uh, life and, that, and fulfillment is having gratitude. And so I think once I figured that out, Mm -hmm. to be present, to be grateful, to look at what is going right, you realize that there's just so much to be grateful for. And then, you know, at the same time, just kind of sinking into the process of it versus fighting it has really helped. But many people don't know what has happened to you in the last year and a half, especially the challenges of the last few months. So can you take us back to February 2019 and what happened? So February of 2019, everything was going great. I was healthy, strong, snowboarding, um, at traveling the world and speaking and just doing everything that I've worked so hard to do. So I had two speeches that I needed to do. I went to Las Vegas to do one speech and then I needed to do another speech in Nebraska. And so when I woke up in Vegas, I got dressed, I got ready to go do my speech, put my, both my legs on, put on four inch heels like I normally do. And as I was walking down the hallway to go to the elevator, I realized that my calf um, was hurting really bad. And I thought, well, I'll just have to deal with this later. So I followed through with doing the speech, 
my calf hurt while I was standing on stage. In fact, right afterwards, I had to get a wheelchair to get back to my hotel room. As soon as I got there, I took my leg off and my leg looked perfectly fine. I massaged it. I, you know, massaged my calf. Everything felt normal. So I, I just kept thinking, well, maybe it's my prosthetic because there was a part in the back of my prosthetic that had been pushing in and it had been doing that for quite some time, honestly, probably for a year and on and off, I would feel a little bit of pressure back there. But then, but then I would go weeks or even months where I wouldn't feel pressure. So I'd kind of forget about it. And so at this point I thought, well, I think I just need to get my prosthetic adjusted and that's what needs to happen. So I decided to follow through with my speech in Nebraska. So I did the speech, used the crutches to get back to my hotel room. Um, that night, everything felt normal and fine. I woke up the next morning though, and I was in sudden major pain. I, it actually woke me up from my sleep. I, I ripped the covers off and my leg, my calf hurt so bad. And I looked at my leg and it was so white. It was the color of the sheets that I was laying in. And instantly I went into a panic. This is the first time I realized, oh, something's wrong with my leg. It's not my prosthetic. And so I scooted to the edge of the bed and I kind of threw my legs over the side of the bed and just started rubbing my leg really aggressively to try to get blood flow going. It was cold. It was white. I was terrified. I just made a flight out of Nebraska as quickly as I could and flew home to Denver and went straight into the emergency room. They did an ultrasound. And a few minutes later, one of the nurses came running in with an IV and she was like, we figured out the problem. You have a massive blood clot from your hip almost from my hip down every artery of my left leg. So my entire blood flow was blocked by this just massive blood clot. You know, when you think of a blood clot, you think of like, oh, you get a little clot in your blood. No, this was my entire left leg. And so they brought in some vascular surgeons, um, which I thought, okay, these guys are going to help me. They're gonna get in there. They're gonna get this blood clot out. Everything's going to be fine. But when they came in, they, they were basically ready to just send me home because they said, there's really nothing we can do. You're already an amputee most of the time. This is what we do is we amputate legs when there's not enough blood flow, but you're already an amputee. But the thing they weren't taking into consideration was that although I lost my legs um, below the knee, I actually still have about 10 inches of my legs below the knee. And so I still have a lot of my lower leg left. And that is a very functional part of my body. That is, um, that's what goes into my prosthetic. It's what helps me walk and snowboard. And in fact, you need a really, really healthy leg with a lot of blood flow to be able to manage the pressure of a prosthetic. So suddenly having this massive blood clot, really what I was facing was either um, having to have my leg amputated above the knee or um, find a doctor that could help me. And so then started, you know, the next journey of my life, really. It's like for the second time in my life, my world flipped upside down. And for the second time in my life, I have been fighting to walk again. And it all started that day. I think when we spoke the first time you said something like they and I th thought it was an important point to make you said something like they felt I was already the worst case scenario and yeah can you restate that and talk about that a little bit yeah it was really interesting what I ran into when this injury hit um in a way, I've forgotten that I am much different than anybody else because I've lived such a normal life. I mean, I've lived an extraordinary life by traveling and speaking and, and, and being on my feet all day and working out and you know snowboarding as much as I do. I, I've never felt limited by my prosthetics. And so to run into these challenges with some of the earlier surgeons who didn't want to help me because I was an amputee, um, 
it was really hard for me to wrap my head around. I was showing them photos. I'm like, but this is me, but I snowboard six hours a day. I don't just sit in a wheelchair because they would say, well, you'll just have to be in a wheelchair and maybe here and there you can walk to the mailbox. That's what a lot of amputees do to put their mail in. And my husband and I looked at each other and we were like, walk to the mailbox, maybe? Like, no, do you know what I do daily? I snowboard six hours a day off huge jumps and compete. And I like, this is, walking to the mailbox is not going to be okay with me. So I begged the surgeons to please go in um, the following Monday to please just do everything they could. They went in that next Monday. They were able to pull out the blood clot from my knee to my hip but they weren't able to pull out the blood clot from my knee down. And it was down three arteries below the knee. And so they sent me home and I went on a mission. I called every person I knew who had any kind of influence. I mean, I was calling any celebrity friends I had. I'm, I'm looking for the best surgeons in the country to be able to help me because I know that the longer this blood clot stays in my leg, um, the more chance I, I won't walk again, or I'll lose my leg. And so um, I, I actually ended up finding a surgeon in Denver uh, a few days later who was willing to see me. And so he said, I think there's something that I might be able to do, but let's get you in surgery as quickly as we can. So I went into surgery. It was a two-day procedure where the first day he inserted these catheters down into all my arteries and started dripping this uh, blood clot, um, it, it's something that would break up the blood clot. Um, blood clot buster is basically what they call it. And so um, I woke up from that surgery in the hospital in absolutely excruciating pain. It was the most painful thing I've ever been through in my life. Um, and I had to endure it for about 24 hours. And then he brought me back into surgery where he went in with different tools and tried to clear out as much of this blood clot as possible. And he was able to do it. He was able to clear the blood clot um, from my knee down all the arteries of my left leg. And so then I ended up going home after that surgery, which took, I'd say at least four months to recover from. And during that time, it was still terrifying. I had to cancel, you know, all my work, all my speeches, you know, I couldn't travel. I was in pain and I had no idea if my leg would actually return to normal. And about four months later, the swelling was down. Um, it, it was more comfortable. I wanted to try a prosthetic. And when I did, I realized that my leg really from my hip down was turning purple and the very bottom of my leg was turning white. So here's, you know, four months after enduring this major surgery and hoping that I'd be able to wear a prosthetic again, it was incredibly discouraging when I realized my leg is still not okay. And so my prosthetist who makes my legs, he recommended a surgeon, a vascular surgeon. So I got in to see him, his name's Dr. Mubarak. And uh, right away, he brought me in to get an ultrasound. And what he saw was that although this blood clot was completely gone, the, the stress on my artery had actually, it, it shrunk my artery almost down to a thread. It was so thin because of uh, the damage to it. And so the problem was I just wasn't getting enough blood flow down to the bottom of my leg. And so he brought me into another surgery where they uh, did an angioplasty and, and he did a handful of other things to kind of stretch open the artery and try to get more blood flow to the bottom of my leg. And then the next day I went into the hyperbaric oxygen chamber where about three hours a day, uh, five days a week for six weeks straight. And, you know, that's a lot of time to sit in there and think <laughs> you're sitting in there by yourself. You can't have your cell phone. You can't have a TV. You can't have anything. It's just a lot of time to sit there and think. And, you know, I definitely felt like I cannot believe what has happened 
to my my life <laughs> in the last six months. I went from being, you know, happy, healthy, traveling, you know, just living life to its fullest to now um, sitting in this chamber by myself. So I went through that process um, for six weeks and my legs started to do okay. This was about last fall. My legs started to do much, much better. And then suddenly um, this spot behind my knee decided to close. And basically when, when that spot closed, that was, that was, my popliteal artery, when it closed off, that's when we realized for sure what had happened in the first place, which was my prosthetic definitely had been pushing um, for, you know, at least the last year in the wrong spot. Every time my leg was sore uh, when I was walking in it, I thought, well, maybe I'm bruising my calf a little bit with my prosthetic, but really what had been happening is it was slowly damaging or injuring the artery and eventually, eventually that artery closed and that's what caused the major blood clot. So that spot decided to close again. Um, however, luckily this time it didn't create another blood clot. Something amazing happened. All these collateral arteries just overnight pretty much just kind of popped up out of nowhere and just rerouted the blood around the spot that closed. And so it was amazing. Wow. When you were going through all these, um, you know, all these medical complications, like, did you have fears and what, like, what was going through your mind and what were you scared of? How did it feel? Um, honestly, I was terrified um, a lot over the last year and a half in a way that I never could have expected. You would think because I've gone through so much 20 years ago that I would be prepared for a situation like this, but I will tell you, it knocked me off my feet, like literally and um, emotionally and, and mentally for about maybe five or six months. I, for the first time in my life, was dealing with chronic pain where every second of the day, my leg was in pain and I was aware of it. And it was the first time in my life that I felt total despair. I would power through the day, okay, but then the sun would go down. I would get terrified that this is going to be my life for the rest of my life. And the only thing that helped me every night, I would go take a bath and just cry in the bath and basically just wash my sorrows and worries away. And I always came out of the bath feeling so much better. So I recommend that actually to anybody who's going through the same thing. If you're dealing with anxiety or depression or despair, to have some kind of escape, a healthy escape, to just be able to kind of break, break the rhythm a little bit and, um, and kind of emerge with a new perspective. And so that, had, that, that kept me going. And it really wasn't until I found Dr. Mubarak and we started taking these steps together, like the hyperbaric oxygen chamber, that I realized I wasn't anxious anymore. I wasn't crying every night every, anymore. That um, because I was taking steps to help myself, whether or not it was going to help me, I didn't know the outcome. I just knew at least every single day I'm taking steps to hopefully get myself in a better position than I'm in now. And just by taking those steps mentally helped me feel empowered again. Were there moments like in that time period when you were having a difficult time, like did, did you feel angry or do you, like how did it? Um, I, 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 I don't know. I'll tell you, first of all, anger is actually a good thing. I once heard that angry people are just empowered, sad people. <laughs> <And> <laughs> when I had moments of anger, mm -hmm. I thought that's actually what I need. I need to be fired up. I need, because this is what is going to motivate me out of this cloud of sadness to do something. And so I definitely had moments of anger. I think I more so though really just had 
major grief and sadness because I spent 20 years working my way up to to be able to do everything I was doing and to be able to also kind of share with the world what the possibilities are and, and to other people, whether they're amputees or not, just what we're capable of. I feel like I was able to just, I was able to represent that and also live a very fulfilling life. And I did feel like the rug had just been pulled completely out from under me. But I will say that even though, you know, even though we we can assume that things aren't going to change when we're in the depths of despair, they do change. They do. Life does continue on and you do get better and you do get stronger and nothing stays the same. And we just have to put our faith in that so that we can take those baby steps forward and continue on. And so I did really good from um, October of 2019 into June of 2020, I, I started working again. Yes, I, I'm I'm on crutches still, and I got this cool little scooter to get around and started traveling and um, kind of getting back to my normal. And even you know, and then of course COVID hit, and so nothing's normal <laughs> all of a sudden. But then we realized I had a secondary issue, uh, which was because of the initial lack of blood flow at the very bottom of my leg. Uh, there's, there's kind of padding that's at the bottom of your leg. The way that they do an amputation often is, you know, they'll cut through the bone and the, and the muscle, but then they kind of wrap it around the bottom so that you have this padding at the bottom. And I no longer had a, that, had that padding because of the initial blood clot and the fact that I wasn't getting blood at the very bottom. And so that padding atrophied. And so all that was really left was skin and bone at the very bottom of my leg. And it made it impossible to comfortably walk in a prosthetic leg. So I knew that I would need another surgery um, to basically kind of re-amputate or do a revision of my initial amputation uh, that the bottom of my leg to be able to get enough padding there. Um, and then at the same time, all of a sudden I got hit again in June where the, the spot that closed in the popliteal artery got bigger where more of that artery closed. And so I was rushed into another emergency surgery where they were able to open up the artery a little bit more and they put a stent in my artery, hoping to keep the rest of it open. Um, that prepared me to be able to go into surgery where I had uh, another amputation of my leg basically. And so that, that was in Boston and that was August of 11th. 2020 that I had that done. And that was such a, it was such a big surgery and it was something I really, it was so hard to wrap my head around because I had my legs amputated below the knees 20 years ago. I never thought I'd have to do it again. And so I chose a surgeon out in Boston who was doing a clinical trial where they didn't just do the traditional amputation of kind of cutting through the bone and muscle and just sewing you up, but he actually connects the muscles so that they can work again. Mm -hmm. And for me, the fact that I dealt with the blood flow issue in the first place, we wanted as much muscle activity as possible because the more muscle you have, the more blood flow you have. And so that's why I felt like it was really critical that I do this, this um, clinical trial and connect those muscles again and just see if I can rebuild my musculature below the knee. And so I had that surgery um, and everything went beautiful. Everything, my leg was in great shape and it was amazing when the doctor went in, he actually saw that I had my full calf muscle. I had all my muscles all the way to the tendons, which was really cool and really rare. Oftentimes amputations are through the muscle, but for me, I had my full mus muscles. So he just had to connect the tendons and basically it allows the muscles to work again for the first time in 20 years. Wow. When you were going through the reamputation the second time, even though of course, right, it wasn't as, as much less than the first time, much less severe. How, how was that for you mentally and emotionally? Like what was going through your mind? Well, gosh, I mean, it, it was a lot. It was a lot. I, it really hit me going into surgery. It, I, it felt like to me, like 
for 20 years, I knew exactly how my legs looked, how they felt, how my prosthetics felt. I had everything dialed in to be able to dance on Dancing with the Stars and snowboard six hours a day. I had spent 20 years dialing my prosthetics in to be able to do that kind of stuff. And, and they were comfortable and they were there. Now with a brand new amputation, I was starting over from scratch. Um, it's not like you go back into the prosthetic that you wore before. It is starting over with a new leg, uh, a new fit process for these prosthetics, hoping your prosthetics fit as comfortable as they did for the last 20 years. So the way it felt to me, it felt like, it felt when I woke up from surgery, it felt like I had floated away in this open ocean, floated away from this island that I had known for 20 years. And now I'm just in the sea of uncertainty and I have no idea what to expect on the other side. I have no idea where this is going to lead me. All I know is that I can't go back. Getting there, still not 100% sure about either leg, but they're getting there. I was thinking of you because I think, you know, we, we sort of look to you as an, ex as an example, like you sort of have become this example of strength for so many people, but that's a lot of pressure too, I would think. You know, um, it. If you feel like you always have to represent strength, then yeah, that can be a huge pressure, especially at a time like this where times get tough. But to be honest, what I really try to do is just be honest and just be authentic with where I'm at. In fact, I've realized that I've been able to kind of help to motivate and inspire people even more, not by telling them what to do, but really by being an example, but by also just kind of, um, being vulnerable and sharing my journey along the way. Why don't you do a little setup that you were going, why you were going back to Boston okay. and then okay. bring us up to yeah. speed. Okay. So I tried to get a prosthetic made and uh, the process went well, except when I stood up in my leg, there's one spot on my real leg that was really painful and really uncomfortable um, to the point of where I couldn't even put my weight on my prosthetic. And I knew it wasn't a prosthetic issue. It was really, it was an issue with my leg. And so I went back to Boston and I went through a bunch of different tests. We did ultrasounds. Uh, he checked my leg out. And the challenge is we couldn't see anything. We couldn't see what the problem was. And so I left there a little bit, um, discouraged, to be honest, because my next step really is putting my prosthetic on and walking. And if I can't do that, then I really am just sitting here waiting until this resolves. And so I ended up actually um, going back and seeing my vascular surgeon here in Colorado. He did an injection of cortisone in my leg um, in that one spot just to see if it helped with inflammation and it didn't help. And then he referred me to another doctor and that doctor ended up doing the same thing, but a lot more aggressively and poked me probably 10 times with needles in around the scar and um, put cortisone in there to try to stop the inflammation. The pain went away instantly. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. However, um, I ended up getting bruising because of that procedure. So actually for the last two weeks, I haven't put my leg on simply because my leg's been bruised. However, I'm, I am um, optimistically, I guess, uh, saying that I do think that that pain has gone away. So now I'm thinking maybe that was a scar tissue issue, um, but I have yet to actually try my leg on and see how comfortable it's going to be. Just waiting for the bruising to go away. And what's like, what's the timeline on something like that? Do you have any idea? I mean, to be honest, this whole journey has been really nerve wracking. It, I could try my leg on tomorrow, but will I? I don't know, <laughs> because it comes down to mentally being prepared. I have to really, um, you know, I have to kind of prepare myself emotionally that okay, what if my leg still hurts? What if I can't walk? What if now what's the next steps? So you know, sometimes 
sometimes fear can do that. It definitely kind of makes us sit back and, and stops us from even moving forward. And, and I certainly, you know, have moments like right now where I've, I've experienced that myself. Even the other day I woke up and, and I was, I, I instantly woke up feeling kind of dreadful. I woke up feeling like, I don't know, like, but you know, like, if I, if I can't walk, then I can't snowboard. And that means my athletic career is done. And then what, you know, I was kind of stacking all these negative emotions and fears on top of one on top of the other. And then I was like, okay, hold on, Amy. Like I, I kind of realized what was happening and what I was doing. And I, I, I decided to set those fears aside and start thinking of the things that I'm grateful for. And I have so much to be grateful for. I started stacking all the things I have to be grateful for one on top of the other and ended up getting out of bed, feeling really empowered and feeling really good and feeling in control of my situation. And, and whether I can control, you know, I can't control the outcome. I know that, but I can certainly control how I'm going to live my life each and every day. And, um, and so it, yeah, I've just, I, I really do my best to try to shift my perspective, but, um, I think in the next day or two, I'll try my leg on again, I'll stand in it and I'll get a good idea if this procedure worked. And if it did work, then really I'll just be starting kind of taking baby steps from that point forward. I think it's funny because like when I listen to you, I think, well, so many people I know, it's just hard enough, whatever, not being able to leave the house or dealing yeah. with kids at home studying. And like, but you've had like, you've had, you've dealt with challenges much tougher than most of us have ever dealt with in our lives. Yeah, but I've also dealt with amazing experiences, probably more than what many have ever dealt with in their lives as well. So, you know, I think the two go hand in hand with every challenge I've ever gone through has come some of the most amazing experiences and opportunities of my life. And some of the most amazing experiences and opportunities of my life have come with some of the biggest challenges of my life. And so I realized that the both, you know, the two go hand in hand. And, um, and I think keeping that perspective and, and reminding myself of that is what allows me to get through some of, some of my tougher moments, just knowing, you know, there's always something on the other side of this. You just gotta keep moving forward. So I was just looking over our notes from the last chat, which was like December 1st or right around then. Right. Uh, I think you were, all of this was ahead of you. So can you just yeah update about what happened in December and where you're at now? Yeah. So let me think. I mean, gosh, December, it became very, very clear to me that there just wasn't enough cushion at the bottom of my leg. And, you know, if I want this to last me another 20 years and be able to do everything that I've done over the last 20 years, then we need to make sure I'm completely covered in all, in all ways. So, um, so I started talking to my surgeon early December, just thinking like, what are we going to do? Because this is not necessarily going to get better on its own. Whatever we need to do to get me walking, let's do it. And he was able to get me into surgery in Boston. And then basically January 5th was the soonest he could get me in. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to kick off the new year and go back into surgery. However, coming into surgery, I really did not know what he was going to do yet. Uh, it was the most uncertain that I've felt this entire time. Last time it was clear as day. We knew I was getting a revision. We knew this is what was going to happen. But this time he really needed to go into my leg and see, um, see what we had to work with before knowing would this be a fairly minor procedure or would this be major, you know, more muscle work and, and reconstruction work. And so in pre-op, we just kind of discussed the two options. One option was we, the one option was to do a, a fat transfer. What this would do, it means you have to have liposuction elsewhere. 
where they harvest the fat. And uh, so what they would do is kind of just smooth out that muscle lump. It's like, instead of taking it all apart and doing this whole big reconstruction, they could just smooth out that muscle lump. Um, and so that was kind of the lesser option. And then the bigger option was to fully start over, basically un take away these muscles that are connected, don't take them away, but detach them and kind of go back to a traditional amputation where the muscles are not connected. But that is a much bigger, more complex surgery. So I really went in, honestly, not knowing what we were going to end up doing. Actually going into surgery that morning, I found out my grandfather had passed and, um, I'll tell you, it's funny. My husband said, gosh, what bad timing? Because, you know, it's like our minds are wrapped around like my leg and getting me through this. But then I thought, well, maybe it's good timing. I mean, it's kind of amazing that my grandpa passed right before I went into surgery. And now I can just envision him, you know, taking care of me and being there. And it actually gave me a lot of comfort. And I woke up from surgery three hours later they ended up going pretty extensive. They ended up doing quite a bit. They kind of did the combination of the two surgeries. So what they did is they ended up shortening my leg more. So they kept bone and muscle and all of that. I, I really wasn't expecting that. But by doing that, they were able to capture a lot more muscle and just really make sure that the bottom of my leg is covered and it will last me a long time. And then they also did the fat grafting where they, um, they took some fat from my hips. So that's actually been the most painful part of it. They took some fat from my hips and they ended up basically injecting it and kind of grafting just kind of around this muscle um, just to give more cushion to my leg. But I have had zero pain. for So for amputating my leg again and doing more extensive work, um, I literally have had no pain. I haven't even had to be on painkillers. Um, I woke up pain-free. Even though I'm going through so much, I'm healing so well. And I'm just focused on, you know, everything that I have to be grateful for. So what was it like, like going in to surgery, not knowing A, which, which of the two um, uh, yeah. modalities they were going to do? And also, you know, not really knowing how much of your leg was going to be. Um, yeah. It was, it was really, really hard. It was harder than, than any of the past surgeries that I've had. I shed a lot of tears between Christmas and, and really January 5th. So going into the new year, I thought, gosh, here I'm going into the new year with a new surgery. And, 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 it, and it actually felt like a big setback initially. I thought, now it's like, I can't move forward unless we do this surgery. And so it felt like, gosh, instead of being a step ahead, like I was hoping, I'm now like three steps behind. I have to go through surgery, recovery, and who knows what I'll be dealing with. But um, so honestly, I cannot say that I went into it with the best mindset. I, I was kind of confused and didn't know which direction we were going to go. And But really, my leg feels fantastic. So we're just hoping that that's exactly what my leg needed. You know, it's just maybe energetically and everything, like the blood flow, everything is working even better because we kind of took things shorter. We added more cushion. So I, um, I do feel really good about it. But once again, you know, like anything, there's, there's a level of uncertainty that I won't know what things feel like um, until I'm in a prosthetic and walking. And that's still, you know, a couple of weeks out, maybe at minimum eight weeks out. And so uh, I guess, tell us about the podcast because our, our story will sink. Yeah. So tell us about it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited. I actually just launched the trailer to the podcast, uh, which is called Bouncing Forward. And I, I got really inspired to do it because I feel like, you know, there's a lot of great podcasts out there about business and, and motivational, but you rarely hear from people who are maybe even going through the thick of the challenge, right? Oftentimes it's, we hear about people who overcame their obstacle and then they're looking back and sharing how they got there. But it's another thing to share the journey and share the process. And, and I find that so many of my followers 
um, on social media are dealing with challenges themselves. It could be COVID related, it could be job related or relationship related, it doesn't have to be all physical. And they often come to me for advice and for inspiration and motivation to get through their challenges. And so I just wanted to bring them on this journey with me. Um, so part of Bouncing Forward is just solo episodes of me, you know, talking about either what I've gone through and how I got through it or what I'm going through today and how I'm getting through it. And also bringing on um, other well-known people as well who like Elizabeth Gilbert is one of our first episodes and talking about some of the ch most challenging times that she's been through and really what helped her get through those challenges as well. So ultimately the idea is it's, it's very motivating. There's tips and tools um, but, but you also don't just skip the hard stuff and get to the nice stuff. It's, you know, really trying to dig into our stories and, and find, you know, find those challenging moments, be able to really share them and, and really give tangible tips and tools to get through those moments as well. And so, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited to create this very positive space where it's not avoiding the challenge it's it's how to work through and get through the challenge that sounds amazing you're coming up on two years since right your challenge sort of this new chapter latest chapter of your challenges began and how does that feel for you yeah i mean i kind of have not wanted to think about that yet two years will be in february since this all began and I know it's probably going to be a bit emotional, but to be honest, hopefully with this surgery, I'll actually be moving forward and walking. And do you ever think, or how do you deal with those feelings? Do you ever have the idea, do you ever think why me? Or I mean, you've had a lot of challenges. You've been really public with your- with Yeah. Your and is that thought into your mind? So I never said why me like 20 years ago when I lost my leg, I never said, why me? I just kind of thought, well, this happened. All I can do is move forward. That's it. But uh, this time I would say, so two years ago when the vascular injury happened, that was the first time that I said, why me? And I, I, I didn't want to go there with my mindset, but I couldn't help it. And I definitely felt like, why, why, like, why is this happening again? Why do I have to start over again? Didn't I learn what I was supposed to learn? Haven't I turned it into a positive thing? Haven't, you know, like, what else am I supposed to be learning from this that I didn't already learn from losing my legs in the first place? And there, so there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that. And and if anything, I, I think I just come back to, you know, maybe I'm supposed to, maybe I can help more people now than even before by going through this. By sh and that's why I've chosen to share the journey versus keep it private. I think maybe I can connect more with other people who are also facing challenges and, you know, need to know that they're not alone. And also the, the different things I'm learning that are, that are keeping me positive and healthy physically, those are the things I want to share. That's another reason why I want to do the podcast is really to share what's helping me get through some of my darkest days, physically, mentally, spiritually, and um, be able to connect with others. And, and I'll definitely say that because I chose to share this journey, I feel more connected with just my community of people that we've built on social media. I, I feel more connected with, with people around me than ever before. Um, and that's a really powerful thing. And I am very grateful for that. So I think when we're going through, when we're going through the mess, you don't always see the message. You know, it's not until you get through it and you look back. And I'm still in it. You know, I'm still in it. I'm not completely on the other side of it. But I also know that, you know, resiliency isn't just, you know, standing on a mountaintop like, yes, I did it. Because then you look in the horizon, you've got even more mountains to climb. So you just got to keep going. And this is my journey of doing that. Thank you.